Hey, Macro Musing listeners, this is your host, David Beckworth. Today's show is about a monetary policy conference that has been held annually in Washington, D.C. for the past 36 years, and as you can imagine, has seen a lot of change. From Paul Volcker's war on inflation, to the dot-com bubble, to the Great Recession and beyond, this conference has covered it all with great speakers including Milton Friedman, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, Larry Summers, and others. I wanted to let you know that this conference, the Cato Monetary Policy Conference, is happening again on November 14th, 2019, with keynote addresses from Federal Reserve Vice Chair Richard Clarita and former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, Paul Tucker. Some of our past podcast guests will also be participating at the conference, including yours truly. It's a great event and a fun place to meet up. So please register online at the link provided in the show notes. I hope to see you there. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is James Dorn. Jim is a vice president for monetary studies at the Cato Institute and is the director of Cato's annual monetary policy conference. He has written widely on Federal Reserve policy and monetary reform. He has also edited more than 10 books, including The Search for Stable Money and The Future of Money in the Information Age. Jim joins us today to discuss the history of monetary policy in Washington, D.C. over the past four decades, as well as some of his own recent work. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Great to have you on. Now, I you know, kind of cut my teeth on monetary policy reading some of your work in the Cato Journal and the authors you've published there and your conferences. I remember in grad school coming to your Cato Monetary Policy Conference. It was a real treat. And the thing that's neat about this is it's been going on for 36 years and 37th in the fall here, but 36 years of monetary policy in Washington, D.C. So you've kind of seen the ebbs and the flows of the interest and in, in the developments of monetary policy. Is that fair? Yeah. When I first started with the first conference was in 1983. And of course, what you had, we were in the great inflation period and stagflation and uh, very volatile monetary policy, stop-go monetary policy. So it, the first conference was on the search for stable money, and uh, that topic is still relevant today, but it was even more relevant at that time because of the uh, erratic uh, monetary policy that uh, was being conducted. Uh, after that, of course, you had the uh, great moderation with Greenspan, and I would say interest in monetary policy diminished somewhat, and the Phillips curve was dead, or we thought – it has nine lives apparently. <laughs> and uh, I remember Al Meltzer who came to many of our monetary conferences and was a good friend as was Carol Bruner, uh, his co-author on many, on many projects. Carol and Alan actually canceled one of the Shadow Open Market Committee uh, meetings during the Great Moderation because they really? said, we don't, wow. we don't need to meet. Uh, the Fed's doing everything pretty well. And of course, their whole function was to be critical of Fed policy. So that's an indicator of how things changed uh, after Volcker uh, basically tightened monetary policy and we got back to a, a fairly stable price level. And then, of course, uh, the Great Recession came about in the crisis of 2008 and uh, everything perked up again with respect to rethinking the whole framework for monetary policy. And, of course, the Fed adopted a new operating framework and uh, a lot of people that studied economics back in the – uh, 70s and 80s, uh, if they didn't uh, read about what was going on now, they would have no idea of how monetary policy is is conducted. And my colleague George Selgin, of course, has done a lot of work on the floor system. So I think right now, I've never seen really anything uh, like what's happened since 2008 with the huge increase in the power of the Federal Reserve, uh, starting with TARP and then quant quantitative easing, interest paid on excess reserves, a new operating system, all the new regulatory issues. So I doubt if the Shadow of Market Committee would cancel a meeting now. Right. Well, how does this compare to the early 80s? So you mentioned your first conference was in the early 80s. So Paul Volcker's 
leading the Fed. There's a double-dip recession. It's very intense. In fact, the unemployment rate actually gets higher than what we saw in 2008, although it was a shorter recession, much sharper recovery. So were people as cynical and as concerned and critical of the Fed then as they are now? Oh, definitely. In fact, we had inflation rate peaking pretty much at about uh, 1980, 13% or so. Uh, The federal funds rate, nominal federal funds rate was almost 19% at one point. Uh, Mortgage rates were very high. Nixon put on the wage price controls, of course, uh, in 1971, August 1971, and then the Bretton Woods system, the gold window was closed in 1971, and then in 1973, Bretton Woods uh, faded away, basically. So you had a different type of international economic system, and we did a lot of work on that as well. But I remember at our first conference, the keynote speaker was Fritz Machlup. This was actually his last speech, and... uh, the title of his speech was um, The Political Economy of Inflation. So he talked a lot about inflation and uh, Carl Bruner gave a talk, uh, I think it was a luncheon talk or maybe the dinner talk. And uh, Carl's talk was on has monetarism failed because you know they were targeting the money supply for a while and uh, that seemed to work okay but it, uh, it faded away too because uh, – Congress basically never put teeth into that into the law, the, and the Humphrey Hawkins Act was passed. But the monetary targets that were in the Humphrey Hawkins Act, they were voluntary targets. Uh, you had to say why you might have missed them. Uh, so the Fed chair had to testify twice a year. They still do that, but they don't talk about mon- money supply targets anymore. And the link between money and uh, prices and income uh, was weakened considerably by the now accounts and sweep accounts and things like that. So at that time, there was a lot of criticism of the Fed for not following a monetary rule of some sort, especially the monetarists. So Bruner argued that, no, monetarism hasn't failed. It hasn't really been tried per se. Okay. And what you meant by monetarism is goes back to David Hume and others is simply that uh, money uh, and variations in its quantity relative to the demand for money is a fundamental cause of inflation and, and uh, business fluctuations, as Clark Warburton pointed out as well much later. So I think that underlying our conference was the idea that – We wanted to improve the monetary regime. We wanted to widen the range of debate on monetary issues. And we wanted to get the best people around to uh, get engaged in that debate. And we were successful on all those grounds and also to get a diverse group of people, including uh, many people, high-level people from the Fed. We had Greenspan speak at three conferences over the years uh, when he was in office. And then uh, we had Bernanke speak and many other Fed officials and so on. So we tried to expose them to other ideas that we, they wouldn't get over at the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, including Leland Yeager's idea for a forecast-free monetary regime and George Selgin, Larry White on free banking issues. So we were trying to educate people too on uh, on on sort of Hayek's view of monetary policy, competitive currencies, but in a friendly environment uh, – rather than a hostile environment. And uh, I think we've been very successful at that. And, uh, you know, I think that's it's very important to take a rational view and to allow uh, alternative, monetary alternatives to uh, be discussed in, in a high-level conference like, like our conference has become. Yeah, you've had some really interesting personalities there. You've had, you mentioned some of them, but you've had also Robert Mundell. You mentioned Carl Bruner, Anna J. Swartz, Milton Friedman, in like fact, you had a conference where Milton Friedman kind of looked back at the uh, his great monetary history with N.J. Swartz and reflected upon what they had learned since then. Greenspan, Ben Bernanke. I believe at the Ben Bernanke conference, he, he actually introduced the summary of economic projections at that particular conference. Is that right? So when he spoke at one of our conferences early on, uh, the title of his talk was The Fed's Road Toward Greater Transparency. Yep. And I believe he did introduce the summary of economic projections at at that conference. Yeah, big innovation at the time. Yes, yeah. So that was a uh, it got a lot of uh, uh, press coverage and uh, the summary of economic projections. You know, if we, if we project forward from that conference, uh, in our 
last conference, uh, we had uh, Jeffrey Frankel speak from Harvard. And Jeff, as you know, is sympathetic towards a nominal GDP targeting yep. type regime. But he also made a very good uh, suggestion and that was to add to the summary of economic projections a line which would give a projection on the growth rate of nominal GDP, which is some of the growth rates, of, of course, of inflation and real economic growth. They list those separately now, but he thought some measure of total spending, a single uh, variable should be, be listed so that we could look at that and if we think in terms of maybe you want 3% real growth and 2% inflation, so you want a, a level targeting, let's say, of 5% and if you miss that, you can make up for it. Um, that would be a good thing because you could basically, even if you didn't have a firm rule, you could look at that and say, hey, we're, it would be, give you a better stance of monetary policy than just looking at uh, short-term uh, policy interest rates. Yeah, I was at that conference and it really was, I think, a clever way to – make that point you know front and central i mean i think you proposed putting it at the very top of the sap right. so first thing you see is nominal gdp um forecast but let me go back to the early 80s i, I wanted to spend a little more bit more time there because you know i am really not old enough to fully appreciate everything that happened other than what i've read <laughs> in books and i i guess i want to get a sense so in the at, in the early 80s when you had this first conference and there were a lot of great monitors there, as you mentioned. Was the critique more about the Fed and the government allowing this kind of unmoored inflation taking off? Or was the critique more about the severe pain? I mean, really, really sharp recession that Paul Volcker engineered. And some would say he didn't have to do it so so intensely. But was there debate on both those points or one more than the other? Well, what, what happened actually was – the Phillips curve mentality was greatly diminished by people speaking at that conference because you had stagflation. You had high unemployment and you had uh, inflation, which was a result of very rapid money growth uh, before Volcker started to tighten things up under Arthur Burns. And uh, Burns, by the way, not only was he chairman of the Federal Reserve – during uh, Nixon's wage price controls early on and so forth. And he gave Nixon the monetary policy that he wanted. He also gave Carter uh, the monetary policy he wanted in the early Carter uh, uh, administration. And in fact, Burns was on this Committee on Investments and Dividends, CID, which a lot of people don't remember. He was appointed chairman. And what he did on that commission, his his – his task was to keep interest rates low. So he didn't have to worry about inflation because inflation was repressed by the price controls. Uh, and meanwhile, he could promote uh, low interest rates. So you had uh, – what, what happened was you had a, a lack of credibility of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve's reputation was highly tarnished and it lost its independence to a large extent. And it wasn't Congress that dodged uh, things. It was the fact that the executive uh, branch, uh, in, including the Treasury Department, uh, which was spokesman for the White House, uh, Connolly in particular, uh, they wanted low interest rates and they got uh, what they wanted from the Fed chairman. Uh, and Volcker, when he came in, changed that around because Reagan wanted to allow him to tighten the money supply and get rid of the inflation and they thought in long-term sense – that once they got the inflation under control, uh, then the markets could operate more smoothly and unemployment should revert to a more natural level. And that's exactly what happened. So the Fed gained credibility, tremendous credibility okay. under Volcker. It had lost it before that. So Bob Weintraub, who spoke at our conference a number of times uh, – and was on the uh, – he was an economist for the uh, Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy. Uh, he wrote a very important article back in 1978 in the Journal of Monetary Economics which discussed the congressional – how the congressional uh, committees and so forth operated to try to guide monetary policy. 
And, of course, they had the Resolution 133 uh, back in 77, I think it was, and then Humphrey Hawkins was passed, that made the Fed responsible for having these monetary targets uh, and reporting to Congress. But what Weintraub pointed out was that that wasn't sufficient because the presidents still got what they wanted pretty much after that. And the Treasury Fed Accord of 1951 was never a, a done deal. The Fed has always been under tremendous pressure to finance deficits. And that happened during the Johnson administration with the war in Vietnam and the uh, war on poverty. And Johnson wanted, just like Trump, he wanted low interest rates and spur the economy so he'd get reelected. So th things haven't changed very much in that sense. We still don't have a monetary rule. It's still a pure discretionary regime. During the Great Moderation, we sort of had a implicit demand rule. Bill Niskan has written about this and, of course, John Taylor uh, with his uh, rule. But we don't really have that, that today at all. So there's, there's a lot to be worried about today with respect to the uncertainty of monetary policy. I recently had Robert Samuelson on the show, writes for the Washington Post now, and he has a book on the great inflation. Part of the book covers the wage controls, price controls, and I think it's an important point to highlight that we've tried them before and they didn't work because there has been suggestions, let's try them now. Let's, let's push the limits. Um, some advocates of MMT, for example, but, but, but even others have said, let's, let's really push, 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 you know, fiscal capacity. And if inflation rises, we can have these other tools. I think it's important to remember we tried them before. They didn't work out so well. But just, just one last, again, takeaway from that early first conference. By the time you guys met, was, was Paul Volcker a revered hero? Was it recognized what he was doing? And was your gratitude, ah, finally someone who's bringing some order to monetary policy? Or was it too early in the experiment still? Everybody hated Volcker. Oh, they hated him. Okay. Oh, yeah. Even the folks at the conference. Not at the conference so much, but the okay. general public. I mean, the backlash. Enemy number one. <laughs> because of the uh, high unemployment rate. And, uh, you know, the, we, had, we had a recession, a s significant recession, but – Volcker stuck to his guns, and that's that's what you have to do. You have to stick to your guns, and, and Reagan allowed him to do it. Yeah, to his, but at, their, to at your credit. conference, and these these monetarists in '83 were like cheerleading, supporting the steps that he had been taking at that point. Yeah, I mean, okay, uh, Beryl Sprinkle was there. Other people, I think Jim Miggs might have been there. Anna Schwartz, Carol Bruder, all right, all right. Yeah, they were. They thought they were doing the right thing. I mean. They they might have changed the target a little bit the way they targeted it. Sure, and, but they and, but they were happy with what well, they were doing. Well, Jim, in some small part, you you gave Paul Volcker a vote of reassurance to the conference. <laughs> Let him know he's not alone during that tough time. All right, let's let's move forward in in time. I always want to touch on some of your other conferences you had, just because they're interesting and they, again they speak to the ebb and flow of interest in monetary policy. Again, I was looking through your. Um, past issues of the Cato Journal. So all these conferences are published in one of the um, issues of the Cato Journal during that year or the following year. And you had a conference in 84, I believe, believe on debt, world debt and monetary order. So tied to this double dip recession where all these emerging markets that you know had huge debt burdens, dollars and all the debt burdens, they crashed. Eventually we get the Brady bonds out of all of this. But that must have been interesting times, too, talking about the, the struggling Latin American countries that had to bear the burden of the recessions. Oh, absolutely. Argentina, other countries uh, actually uh, did a book down in Argentina on the, on the debt crisis down there. Uh, it was published in, in, in uh, Spanish down there. But our conference was on uh, dollars, deficits, and trade. And Bill Niskan and I actually uh, edited a book on that. And okay. We had people like Rudy Dornbusch in the book and uh, Jan Tumler. And, uh, you know, the problem with the twin deficits, fiscal deficit and the uh, trade deficit and so on. And um, one of Greenspan's talks actually was on the evolving U.S. payments imbalance. So, again, we're, you know, what's Trump talking about? You know, trade imbalance and so forth. Uh, although Greenspan was uh, much more knowledgeable about this and took a, a fairly <laughs> rational Right. rational approach on it. Um, 
And Greenspan also gave a talk later on on uh, monetary policy in the face of uncertainty. And that's one thing that a, a lot of the monetarists and others uh, were emphasizing, the great degree of uncertainty in a regime that's based more on discretion than on some type of rules. The international system now, of course, one of the big things we, at another conference we had in London, actually, we had a conference in uh, Mexico City and we had a conference in, in London. The one in Mexico City was on monetary arrangements in the Americas after NAFTA. So that was a important conference. And uh, Roberto Salinas Leon, uh, who's an old friend, uh, he and I edited a book on, uh, on that. And we had a lot of uh, internationally known economists at that uh, conference as well. But the one on London uh, was on global monetary order. It was interested in – that was back in 19 uh, – 1990. So we discussed the euro, the euro and the emergence of the eurozone. Uh, Sir Alan Walters was there. He gave one of the keynote talks. Uh, he was very skeptical of uh, creating a, uh, the euro. Anna Schwartz was too because there was never really a solid monetary union without a, for, uh, a prior political union. And they saw political problems arising from the eurozone. So this is 1990. You guys were discussing the challenges of moving towards the euro. Yeah, and we we had very another, critical view back then. And we had uh, we had other con another major conference on the euro actually in the United States. But uh, yeah, so the, the conferences not just looked at domestic monetary policy. We're interested in global monetary policy. And John Taylor uh, just gave a a paper uh, on uh, a rules-based international monetary regime. Now, Carl Brunner had an idea a long time ago. In fact, he he wrote about this back in the 1980s. What he he wanted a club of uh, of global financial stability, and his his prescription was basically that we shouldn't look at coordination among governments, uh, force coordination among governments. We should. Each major player should have their own domestic monetary rule and then they could join this club and it would be a club of major countries uh, similar to Bretton Woods. But this would be based upon a domestic monetary rule that would guide the long-term growth of the money supply. In fact, if you look at Section 2A of the, 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 the Federal Reserve Act as amended in 1977 – Section 2A now reads even different than that. The one in 77 had a clause in there about letting the monetary aggregates, money and credit growth should be in consistent with long-run real growth. It's a monetary rule in a sense. And uh, the 77 amendment basically said, okay, this is what they should have targets and things like this, but – Nobody should be – nobody can be held accountable. The Fed can change its mind. It just has to say why it changed its mind. OK. So later on, they took that clause out that if you read Section 2A today, it just says commensurate with the money – the monetary aggregates you grow commensurate basically with real output growth. And this will help us achieve the goals of stable prices, maximum employment and uh, – uh, long-term interest rates that are are kind of normal, mod, you know, moderate nor long-term interest rates. So, a lot of the people saw that as long-run goals, but Fed policy has been very, very myop myopic, and that's because most of the, a lot of the presidents have been myopic. They want to get reelected. Congress myopic. So there's been some uh, movement in the last several years. Uh, in fact. Uh, Brady wanted to uh, inter – he introduced legislation and Hensling did also to have a uh, – basically a centennial commission on monetary policy to talk about rules and they suggested in some of the legislation actually suggested a, a rule. Uh, it would be a benchmark rule, sort of like a Taylor rule. But nothing, nothing has become of that yet. I know the Form Act was a big part of that conversation That's at least right. and uh, – I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. You just alluded to something, though, interesting. You alluded to 
the Fed being influenced by all these presidents. And you had a conference on this idea about political business cycles. So maybe just summarize for our listeners, what is a political business cycle? Well, a political business cycle is motivated by the election cycle. And presidents want an accommodative monetary policy to keep the economy expanding, which means they want low short-term interest rates at least, uh, if not long-term interest rates, which we get now through or at least try to get through quantitative easing and things like that. So there's been a lot of debate on the political the business cycle because some people find that the, the Fed exercises independence and under some presidents you get a, kind of a political business cycle like Burns with Nixon and Carter and so forth, Johnson. Yep. Uh, and then others you don't, like with Volcker, uh, with Reagan. So Weintraub wasn't looking so much at a political business cycle in some of the work he was doing. He he wasn't saying that, you know, the Fed always caters to ease money and so forth during election. What he was saying is that the Fed ultimately, it seems, bows to the uh, – executive branch into the White House. So if if Reagan and uh, other presidents like Eisenhower, for example, want stable money, uh, low in, lower inflation, they'll get that. If, if other presidents want uh, high money growth, low interest rates uh, and so forth, they can get that. Now, uh, Greenspan was probably – the best in the sense that he had this great moderation and he followed kind of an implicit rule. When he went away from that and they held interest rates too low for too long, as Anna Schwartz points out in the early 2000s, that helped lay the basis for the financial crisis. They've never admitted that. But I think you can make – that's part of the deal. That's part of the argument possibly. Uh, right now we have real interest rates that are negative and that does not seem to be the natural state of affairs. Because even though demographics and other things might lead to lower natural rate of interest, let's say, uh, you wouldn't expect a negative uh, uh, Wixellian type interest rate uh, because as long as time preferences are positive and as long as capital has some pro positive productivity, you could argue that interest rates, real interest rates should not be, be negative. Uh, so when you get real interest rates are negative and then you get an inverted yield curve, something's upside down. It doesn't seem right. And these are things that, of course, we're concerned about right now. But uh, it goes way back into the monetary history literature. And one well, thing let – Well, let me ask this about the political business cycle, if I may. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so what you're suggesting is that – even that idea, kind of the ebbs and flows of independence. So Greenspan seemed to have crafted some independence for the Fed, became the, became the norm, whereas before him, maybe not so much. We take it for granted. And now Trump seems to be kind of chipping away at some of that independence. And as you said, the president wants low interest rates going into an election, which has been something that's happened before. It's not the, Trump is not the first president to want this. It's just that we haven't seen it past few presidents. So we shouldn't be surprised, but maybe disappointed. Yeah. Well, Trump obviously has been much louder than other presidents, uh, calling the Fed's policy very destructive and uh, ridiculing the uh, quantitative tightening. And everybody hears it, okay? They used to do it in private. You know, Lyndon Johnson might get somebody out at the ranch, you know, and corner him. Right. I've heard that story. Yeah. Going up against the wall, physically, yeah. you know, threatened him. <laughs> yeah. But um, the Fed seems to be more swayed by the Wall Street stock market. Uh, and you look at, for example, in December when they increased – the Federal Federal Market Committee increased the target range uh, by – 25 basis points basically. So it's between two and a quarter and two and a half percent. And they, that was a fourth increase in 2018. Trump didn't like that at all. Now, they were worried about 
different things. But uh, in January at the American Economic Association, when uh, I was there and uh, uh, Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke and, and uh, Jerome Powell were all on stage and Powell got up and he started talking about we need to be patient because the markets tanked after they increased the rates in December, as you remember. Yeah. And uh, the Fed's changed its stand since then. Now, I think there's probably a pretty strong argument that the December rate increase was a mistake. If you look at the growth rate of nominal GDP, it was about 5% at that time, which would be about what you'd want it to be. And uh, therefore, the way the monetary policy is run now, it's, it's totally data dependent, but data changes they, uh, and it's revised and so forth. And nobody can predict the future. I mean, interest rate forecasting has been a disaster for the most part. Nobody has been close. Nobody was, was predicting at the beginning of the year what uh, long-term bond rates would be now. Two percent, right? <laughs> yeah. So those long-term bond rates, by the way, uh, may be due to the fact that um, things are, are bad in Europe too and other places, uh, but you have negative real rates in Europe. So yeah, that, that's the question I was going to ask. So you argued earlier that negative real rates seem unnatural. But if I look around the world, it seems to be fairly common. And in many cases with central banks, you know, you know tightening, they're not easy. And so maybe it, is, is there any argument to be made that it is something natural is causing this to happen globally? Well, I think it's the policy of the banks themselves that are you know, forcing rates, you know, charging people, for example, in, in – uh, in various countries in Europe, rates to hold deposits at the central bank. Instead of paying them like we do, interest on excess reserves are charging them. So when you do that, you can basically call that a negative interest rate. It's not due to natural forces or what anything. What about the, like the longer 10-year yields? So like Switzerland, Germany, those countries have like negative 10-year nominal yields, right? So yeah, that, doesn't that seem more market-driven on the long end? Yeah, I think it probably is somewhat market-driven. Uh, although quantitative easing has probably led – the first batch of quantitative easing didn't have much mm -hmm. effect. But later on, uh, I mean, uh, Gagnon and other people have done empirical work to show that the quantitative easing uh, was one reason that uh, longer-term rates went down. Forward guidance is another reason because if you uh, keep short-term rates – if you think the longer rate is, uh, you know, propelled by – short-term rates and expectations, if the expectations that uh, rates are going to be held lower for longer through forward guidance, that could affect market uh, sentiment and so okay. forth. So there's there's arguments, uh, you know, that you could get into. But um, I think that uh, negative rates are an anomaly, uh, although some people want to use them and they want to get rid of cash as a result, uh, you know, to make those easier to to uh, engineer. Speaking of Joe Gagnon, which you just mentioned, had done work on quantitative easing, let's go to the most recent monetary policy conference and talk about some of the papers that were presented there. And full disclosure, I was one of them. <laughs> yes. So we'll be glad to discuss mine too if you're interested in it. But let, let's chat about that. Let's chat about some of the papers, some of the discussion. In fact, one of the papers there speaks to this very thing, this very topic of, nat of negative interest rates. So, so walk us through what what were the issues covered at the most recent conference, and how do they reflect the the times we live in? Well, we spent a lot of time on the operating system, the new operating system, the so-called floor system, uh, away from the court, old corridor system that we had, where uh, reserves were kept modest, and they could simply change the supply of reserves to get the Fed funds rate that they wanted. And now the reserves are so abundant that uh, basically the Fed no longer – there's no really federal funds market anymore. The Fed administers rates uh, by using the interest on excess reserves and uh, the overnight uh, reverse repo rate. So it's it's a much different system now. And uh, the Fed has made a decision basically to continue this system – uh, and uh, they want to provide for ample reserves, which means that they don't want necessarily the amount that they have now, but they want to have that sweet spot where they can still operate a, uh, a floor-type system. And uh, 
The problem with the uh, and, and this was discussed at the at the conference. Uh, the problem George Selgin and others discussed it. Uh, problem with interest on excess reserves. If that rate is above the the opportunity cost, the market rate, like the one year Treasury, let's say, which it was for some time, uh, then there's a big demand for banks to hold reserves at the Fed rather than lend them out. And Phil Graham in his talk at the conference um, basically was critical of this type of regime because it, 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 it interferes with the so-called monetary transmission mechanism whereby in the past if you had open market operations and you're buying securities in the open market, it adds to the base money, the, to the reserves. And then the commercial banks can lend that out if it's profitable to do so and that affects – uh, nominal income and prices. That's the, sort of the route that it takes through the interest rate mechanism. They changed the focus uh, after 2008 uh, no, more to a, towards a Bernanke-type wealth effect whereby they would keep interest rates low for longer and use quantitative easing and forward guidance basically to encourage people to take risk and to buy more risky assets. And that's what – I think, helped propel the stock market. And, of course, there were real factors too, Trump's tax uh, cut and so forth. And uh, But for many quarters and years, uh, the economy was growing very slowly, but the stock market was going up by double digits. So if you look at the financial pages every day, you see that the, all they talk about is Fed policy. You know, what's the Fed going to do? So – Phil Graham's been critical of, of Fed policy and the way things are, are working, um, and he he almost takes an Austrian viewpoint that the interest rate is an intertemporal price, and it's an important thing to coordinate uh, decisions in capital markets. And when the Fed comes in and it misprices uh, credit and risk. Uh, that encourages more risk taking, and that disturbs the capital markets, and that has real effects. And uh, Claudio Borio, who spoke at uh, our conference, uh, he spoke uh, at that conference, but he spoke, uh, I think, uh, a year or two before that, em emphasized the importance of trust in a monetary uh, regime. And uh, he's also worried about the uh, mispricing of credit and that the Fed uh, and other central banks are, without being guided by any type of monetary rule, uh, have gained more power and they've distorted, they've distorted uh, prices and in, intertemporal prices. So that was one theme. Uh, other people like uh, yourself and uh, Gagnon even, uh, Jeff Frankel, interested in uh, talking about uh, nominal GDP targeting – uh, what you call level targeting in particular where you make up for misses and that that would be a better system than inflation targeting because you don't have to worry about supply side shocks. You allow them to be absorbed by uh, pr uh, price level changes basically. So you hold M times V constant basically. Uh, you allow them to adjust to each other through – actually through markets – uh, and you make it known that you're going to allow for a, a limit, let's say 5% or 4% growth in nominal GDP. And this is becoming more and more popular. Uh, Scott Sumner uh, right. has also worked on this. And Scott talked about 10 lessons from the monetary crisis. And, and uh, one of the lessons, of course, is that, uh, as you pointed out, and Scott and, and other people, that initially they tightened monetary policy uh, because the Fed basically sterilized, uh, you know, any type of quantitative easing that was going to be used was sterilized uh, and also by using the interest on excess reserves so it wasn't lent out. And there was a lot of uncertainty in the monetary regime and also other areas in the economy. So banks were – there wasn't much of a demand for private investment funds and so forth during that time. Uh, now that uh, the economy started to grow again and, 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 and Trump cut taxes and, uh, and so on, uh, Phil Graham's worried that in this type of thing, what's going to happen is a market 
interest rates are going to be set such that long-term rates start to increase normally because of the high deficits, because of the economies heating up, and for other reasons. And this could this th- this could throw off Fed policy. The Fed would have to follow the market, in other words, which the Fed has to do anyhow, ultimately. So we talked about some of these things. We um, Vincent Reinhardt had a very interesting paper on an unconventional assessment of unconventional monetary policy. And if you remember at the conference, since you were there, uh, one of the major points, one of the, one of the major points uh, he made was that when you set a precedent of encouraging risk taking by keeping rates lower for longer and forward guidance and so forth, you sort of create a moral hazard problem. It's like a uh, Bernanke put with a Greenspan put or now the Powell put. If the markets expect you to cave in every time and you don't have any other stands for monetary policy like nominal GDP targeting and so forth, uh, then down the road, the Fed credibility is going to be, well, the Fed's just bluffing and they're going to cave in. And uh, this this can lead to uh, bubbles in asset markets and if the bubble bursts, as they all do at some point, you can then have a uh, boom-bust type type cycle and lead to a to recession. Now, Claudio, Claudio Boreal was, wasn't at this – well, he was at this conference, but he's worried about that too in his writing at the uh, Bank for International Settlements. And one other paper I've already mentioned uh, briefly is Jeff, Jeffrey Frankel's paper, uh, which I think I already made the point on the uh, – what he wanted to do with summary economic projections. Right. Yeah, no, that was it was a great conference, and you know, one of the papers there, though, we alluded to earlier was Andrew Levin and Michael Bordo's paper about negative interest rates, and you know, I, I want to ask this question, kind of going back to your your comment about you know negative rates, negative real rates, um, quantitative easing, um, the moral hazard problem, the um, point made by Vincent Reinhardt. One of the puzzles the Fed faces. Is despite all these these developments you've mentioned, negative real rates, QE, intervention here and there, everywhere, we still have really low inflation, right? We have, in fact, below target inflation, and the Fed itself has, you know, stroking its chin, acting puzzled. Um, so, how do you interpret that? I mean, because you, you outline these potential indicators that would indicate it's being too easy, but on the other hand. We don't see hardly any traction. In fact, nominal GDP growth is below the average what it was before the crisis. Inflation seems to be growing slow. So what's going on there? Well, I would say that we don't have inflation in the traditional sense of the word, but we certainly have asset price inflation. So maybe that's what it's showing up, more of an Austrian-style uh, uh, model. That That's one possibility. And uh, you got to remember, too, that Ultra-low interest rates, even negative interest rates, have harmed a lot of people. In fact, a friend of mine who ran a big uh, uh, fund at uh, one one of the investment firms, uh, he's retired now, but he said the biggest uh, cost to seniors is the negative interest rates, which have been he said, engineered by the Fed, and he's a very uh, astute financial analyst. And that's true. There has been a, a cost. Uh, if you have a million bucks in a money market fund, you're getting uh, about 25 basis points on it. And then you have to pay tax on the interest you earn. So people are actually saving more because they have to make up for saving they can't do. So, But that saving is not going into private investment. Uh the the banks are basically buying uh, treasury, treasury security and so forth. What, so this is combined too with the credit. Uh, the Fed, as Charlie Plosser and others have pointed out, has been engaged in credit policy more than just pure monetary policy uh, with buying up huge amounts of mortgage-backed securities. And, uh, and it's also by paying interest on excess reserves, uh, it can use that uh, – when it gets at it, it reverts back to the treasury. The treasury can use that to make it look like the deficits aren't as high as otherwise too. So you've got all these uh, interventions into 
what would be nice if we had this nominal GDP rule or some other rule that would lend certainty. Uh, I, I don't see the problem as too little inflation. Uh, rather, I see it as too much discretion and too much power. Uh, and uh, uh, Charlie Calamiris has focused uh, in various conferences on the rule of law and how the Fed, uh, through its uh, creation of various facilities during the crisis and so forth, Larry White's pointed this out too, has undermined uh, the rule of law. So, neg- I mean, J- Jim Grant, who you, you know well, yep. uh, just wrote a, a nice book on Badgett, uh, said in all the history of central banking and banks, there's never been a period where you had negative real interest rates were engineered by by banks per se. He said it's unnatural uh, for the reasons, some of the reasons I've stated. So remember, you, you can't measure or see the natural rate of interest. Uh, it's a it's a concept, just like demand supply curves are concepts, blackboard economics like uh, Coase used to talk about. And a lot of the forecasting models that we have and the Fed's models and Included. You have to have models, I suppose. I'm not against modeling. Uh, but they certainly – nobody predicted the Great Recession. Uh, and predicting interest rates is very, very difficult. So I think – so we don't get lost you know, among the trees. We look at the bigger picture. Uh, we go back to the fact that we need to improve the monetary regime – so that it operates to bring about prosperity in a free society, and that's one of the main objectives of our center here and also the conference. But it's as you know, these are highly complex topics. Right. And I've been studying this for over 40 years, and I went to graduate school and studied with Leland Yeager and learned a lot of monetary economics. A lot of the stuff I learned at that time has been turned turned around to a certain extent, although the basic truths still remain, I think. But Leland got involved more in terms of thinking how we can get a decentralized monetary system that is forecast-free. What does that mean, forecast-free? Well, I think it's like the gold standard, which was a, it had sort of an automatic adjustment I see. system. I okay. That the supply of money, we don't know what the optimal supply of money is, but if it's driven by the demand for money and it leads to price stability over a long period of time, not le- I mean, during the gold standard, the price level changed, went up and down, but over a long period of time, it was stable. Uh, that type of system doesn't require central planning or a central bank. Uh, the central bank can be involved in that, uh, but it could be a private central bank like the Bank of England was. But we need to think outside the box, too, in terms of um, why couldn't the market supply comp- competing currencies? And that's why this digital age is important with the, the information age and talk about, uh, you know, digital currencies and maybe some algorithm that would lead to a stable supply. There's a stable – stable now it's called, I guess, uh, currency. Larry White's looking into a lot of this stuff. But there's a lot of exciting avenues opening, and I think the Fed's credibility at this point is not great. Uh, and if we go go into a, another period where we have stagflation, which is not impossible, uh, then there might be an opening. But uh, even during hyperinflations, we still go back to a central bank. So what we want to do is improve the operation of the current system and see if we can't do better. Speaking of the digital age – Mark Andreessen famously said, software will eat the world. You know, I wonder if, if you foresee a world where AI, smart machines, you know, having access to real-time universal data, so you know, putting aside privacy issues for the time being, imagine a, a smart machine monitoring every bank account, every transaction, every you know, financial move can, can in real-time figure out you know, real money demand shocks and, and adjust – so it's 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 kind of a mix between monetary policy on pilot, but also you could argue kind of discretion. I mean, do you see a future like that where machines kind of in real time do monetary policy? Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> okay. I don't think there's any political or motivation. Uh, just think of all the uh, 300 or more economists on the Board of Governors uh, that work there from top schools. They wouldn't have anything to do. So you've got special interests that would uh, like to keep, you know, work on monetary policy issues. 
and uh, and I'm a libertarian and I, and I like freedom, but I want sound money too. So can we bring it about by a freer system? Well, we can certainly improve on the system we have now. And I think we need to study economic history uh, to learn from the past. Uh, we, from 1983 when I started these conferences now, the search for stable money is still on. It's just a question the, – there's different things going on and lo- different th- things that we've never even thought about before like these negative re- uh, interest rates and uh, digital currencies and things like that. So I'm not sure – I really want the Fed to get involved in digital currency. I'd rather have the markets do it. And uh, the Fed's already involved in too many things. Uh, they ought to split off regulation uh, to uh, and let. Uh, f- I, I think financial markets took a big hit in the sense of their credibility because uh, uh, everybody thought, well, these financial markets always work fine. You know, we don't need any regulation and so forth. And then we get over regulation, and then the pendulum swings back somewhat. So. Our center is concerned not only with monetary policy but with financial regulation and we'll try to get a more market-oriented uh, picture of that. So what would be, in your view, the ideal system for the Fed to follow? So you could play God for a few minutes here and you could snap your fingers and boom. Given the world we live in, where technology is, where things are in terms of global capital flows, all those issues – how would you design an optimal monetary regime? Well, one of the uh, panels at this year's monetary conference, which is uh, going to be uh, on November 14th here at Cato, is on an optimal monetary system for a free society. All right. So come and find out, huh? <laughs> and uh, the people that are going to be on that panel have thought about this a lot. Uh, George Selgin, my colleague, uh, Dino Fala Shetty, uh, his former chief economist on the House uh, Financial Services Committee, uh, Will Luther, who you know well, and Steve Hankey. So we'll get a picture. In terms of my own thinking, I I used to just sort of like the idea of a simple rule, like Friedman's uh, money growth rule. And Anna Schwartz said if, if we actually had that at one point, maybe all these other alternatives and now accounts and all this stuff wouldn't have merged – Philosophy would have been more stable and it would have worked fairly well. Uh, so we never really tried it and I think that's what uh, Carl Brunner would probably say too and Alan Meltzer. But uh, I'm attracted to this uh, nominal GDP level targeting uh, for the reasons we discussed a little bit earlier. But on the other hand, I also think that we ought to allow for experimentation uh, – with digital currencies and maybe somebody's going to come up with some something we could never anticipate. So I don't believe quite in designing systems. I think they're very hard to design because we don't have the information, we don't have the knowledge. Rather an evolution of systems that will occur, maybe some type of parallel monetary system, uh, which would keep the Fed on its toes. Uh, I remember George Selgin thought the euro would be good in the sense that it would be a competitive system to the to the Fed. Uh, he, he didn't say it would be the best system, but uh, at least it would be some competition. And, and Hayek initially talked about competing national currencies and then went to private currencies and so forth. So, But you have to be realistic what you can accomplish, but you have to all have some ideal – uh, in mind, and I guess my ideal is I'm in favor of monetary freedom and capital freedom and individual freedom and the rule of law. So we can use that to shape a system. Uh, I mean, I, I think we should discuss the classical gold standard in the system. Uh, it was consistent with the rule of law. It put constraints on the fiscal system. They issued consuls, which were uh, bonds into perpetuity. You could never issue those today. Uh, so there's a lot more trust in that particular type of system. But, of course, when things went bad, they, uh, you know, basically put convertibility on the shelf. And uh, that's what we did with certain things when the monetary targeting uh, – well, when the gold cover uh, for the dollar. It used to be uh, – 1945, it was um, I think 25 percent. They ended that by 1977. Johnson uh, got the Congress to change the law, so they ended the gold uh, cover for both deposits and currency. And uh, Weintraub, 
uh, Bob Weintraub thought that, you know, putting a, a limit like that on was good. It was at least some type of limit. And when they got rid of that, of course, the uh, dollar production money supply went up even more and eventually led us to go off to, off any kind of vestige of the gold standard in 1971. So, well, 1971 uh, – Let's see, was it 1967? Humphrey Hawkins was 77, 45. Yeah, 1945 was 25%. And then Johnson, it must have been uh, 1967. Okay. That, uh, I, I'd have to check the dates. That's, but I, anyway, the yeah. gold cover was taken off. Um, and we, we no longer have any cover for Federal Reserve notes, simply uh, pure fiat money. But you're suggesting put something rules-based in, in play, and then let experimentation maybe open up new opportunities. I mean, today, Facebook announced its own um, digital current cryptocurrency. Was it Libra, the name of it? Yeah. And it's going to be kind of a, my understanding, a stable coin type uh, cryptocurrency. So who knows? Maybe Facebook will be the next great thing in monetary systems. Yeah. You just don't know. Yeah, but we have to allow experimentation. Yep, exactly. But we have to be able to explain how a market-oriented monetary system would operate. We have to have some knowledge of that. Otherwise, you're just operating in in the dark, and nobody's going to go along with that. You have to have some because there's network effects and everything. You have to be able to explain, you know, why this may be a stable system or why it may not be a stable system. And that's the task of your monetary policy conference in the center here. At the Cato Institute. That's right. Well, our time is up. Our guest today has been Jim Dorn. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.